and welcome back to uh, the first session of day three, the final day of IDTX 2023. I want to kick the day off by thanking everyone who presented over the past two days and thanking you, the audience, for showing up across three days. It's very much appreciated. It's very exciting. Uh, yesterday was officially the busiest day at any IDTX event we have ever held. So thank you for that. Um, I'm going to get out of the way real quick because this session is going to be a half hour session today. Uh, and we have the fantastic Angela Ross from Sub 10 joining us. Um, you're not here to hear from me. So I'm going to uh, shut up and get off the stage. Over to you. Thank you, Tom. What a lovely introduction. And it's lovely to be here. As Tom said, I'm Angela. I'm from a company called Sub 10, one of the founders. And we've been going about four years. And I wanted to um, address something that I've discovered in the past four years, because I used to be an instructional designer. I actually still am. I don't think it ever leaves you, does it? It's always part of, if they cut you open, it's written inside you like a piece of rock. It's always there. Um, so I'm very proud of being an instructional designer. And something I've come across during the last four years is something called learning culture. Um, and trying to understand what is a learning culture and how does it apply to instructional designers? And what is it we can do to almost take the mantle and drive forward to create what I call a positive learning culture? Because there aren't many organizations out there that have a positive learning culture. And it's a really important thing, um, especially as we're looking at going forward into the future. Um, so but I'm looking today at learning a little bit of technology, but less so because I think we can't really control too much of the ed tech that's out there the uh, clunky LMS systems, the learning management systems. But I'm looking at contemporary business and what's going on. We're living in a world of constant change. And I think we're all kind of aware of that, especially in recent times. And over the years, I've actually, I've been an instructional designer for 22 years, which is quite scary. Um, almost at the point of starting with the typewriter, I have to say. But I've seen so many changes and transitions. One thing I haven't really seen is the shift or change in the um, technology that we're using. We still seem to be sort of stuck in an era where we're using, uh, as I say, clunky LMS systems. Content, content in of itself tends to still be in the corporate world, certainly, those one-off annual events, almost that checkbox exercise. And that's frustrating as well. So. We're living in this world of constant change. There's a lot going on. We've had the pandemic. We've had a lot of content. I think it used to be in 1995, about 4% of companies used digital online learning. Now it's over 90%. And I think the pandemic has a part to play in that, in that a lot of content shifted and moved online. Because of the constant change and the things going on around us in the world, we've got more coming at us. We've got all of these challenges and the reason for sort of presenting this up front is to give you a bit of context around why there's pressure on us to look at the bigger picture and look at the role of learning within organizations and as instructional designers to see what part do we play in pushing that in the right direction going forward. So the pressures that are upon us are lots of things, remote working for one, you know, online learning has become a, a massive thing um, out there, not always the best quality as everything moved rather quickly and there probably is a time for reflection and adjustment of some of the content that's out there. We've got executives seeing um, talent and employee retention and engagement as being hugely important. Learning's a big part of that, massive part of that. Automation and AI, upskilling and reskilling, that's going to need effective learning. Just in time learning as well. So solutions that are there at the fingertips, basically. And then we've got improvements in Wi-Fi. Data is a massive thing in terms of return on investment. So lots of pressures on us. And then what would the future workplace look like? That's moving. That's hurtling at a great speed. Businesses are looking at, we've got companies, you know, like manufacturing companies with Internet of Things plugged into every device and every tool and every piece of equipment going. How can we utilize that in the future? And I think in the future, I'm a piece of machinery or a forklift truck in a warehouse, which is monitoring how often it has a load on it. So how often is it in use? That data about the effectiveness in terms of the use of that piece of equipment 
can be plugged into a system where we can identify pieces of equipment that aren't being used effectively and trigger a learning event. So if you've got an employee who's constantly coming in and using a piece of equipment um, and it's not being used effectively, I want that to trigger automatically rather than a manager having to do it. That should trigger a learning event. So they should get a piece of information content nudged towards them to do. There are a couple of other things about the future uh, workplace and what the um, experts think they're going to look like. So I've got a few examples here. That first lady, she's um, showing there, she's on her computer. She's got a meeting coming up later in the day. That meeting's about analytics and data. Are there a couple of units, learning units that she could do just in time? Again, it's nudging that content towards her at the appropriate moment based on data that a system or technology is picking up. And it might be AI, it might be AI driven platforms. This is what the future of, of learning should be though. It should be seamlessly integrated into the workflow. And then the person at the end there is doing some micro learning. They're doing some little bite-sized pieces as and when they need it, when they're talking to a customer, they're using a new system for the first time. And that um, learning is being embedded into really short pieces basically. So the future of learning is going to be very different to what we've got now. It's going to be about constantly learning on the go, just in time pieces. And so what would a learning culture actually need to look like? We're talking about a future where humans and machines are working more and more together succinctly. Um, and we're looking at topics as instructional designers. We're probably not going to be doing the old traditional topics that we cover at the moment. There may be a change or a shift where we're looking at things like innovation management, um, teaching, uh, conversing, mentoring, systems thinking. It might not be the practical tasks that we're used to writing about today, but more and more about the AI, the automation, and writing around those aspects. So all of these pressures, all of these changes, the future workplace environment are things I think as instructional designers we need to be aware of and thinking about. But rather than being behind the curve, I think it'd be great if we were ahead of the curve and we were driving this forward. We need workplaces that enable learning. And I just want to take a minute and have everybody who's listening in, have a think about an organization perhaps you've worked with recently and created some training for or the organization you are part of. What do you think learning is like in terms of learning culture? What do you think the learning culture is like within that organization? Is it positive? Is it negative? Um, so if it's a positive learning culture, what you'd expect to see is very much people who are self-serving, uh, accessing learning as and when required, looking for opportunities to learn. They really prioritize their time around um, learning being at the heart of everything they do. They're looking for those, seeking out those um, opportunities to pick up more skills, to talk to other people, to do a task, to do a piece of learning. It's really part of their job. So we've got here a positive learning culture is a mindset within an organization where learning and improvement are at the heart of how people prioritize their time, do their jobs and interact with one another. They're actively seeking out opportunities to develop themselves and others and improve the organization as a whole. And then the opposite of that, which I've seen countless times, um, and I'm, I'm going into an organization later today. And when I look around, you've got that, that attitude towards learning where it's like, it's, it's just something we have to do. It sits on the periphery. We've got to get it done. When you mention training to anybody, you get that kind of long sigh and like, oh, do I have to? That's a negative learning culture. That's what we want to get away from. And I think as instructional designers, we're, we can be part of not a revolt, but like a, a change or a shift towards helping support organizations with this mindset. It's kind of like, what can we do as IDs? We are in a quite a powerful position because people look to us as experts when you go into an organization and help them with their learning. People are looking for advice and support. And I know it's difficult because quite often I've been in the past part of projects where you just end up shoehorning lots of content into a solution. And you know it's not the best um, approach, but you end up just giving the company what they need. 
I think there's more we can offer as instructional designers and it might off it might actually be a kind of a revenue stream for you as well as if you're a freelance ID it might be an opportunity for you to work with an organization and not only provide them with the learning that they require but also perhaps help support them with an angle or an aspect they've never thought about their learning culture there are things we can do to try and help support a company to establish whether it has a negative or a positive learning culture. And then there are things we can do as part of our solution. Of course, the, the design of the product that we come up with or the content we create, engaging, maybe short bite-sized pieces. Um, and then there's three key things underneath design that are showing there on the screen. In order to create a positive learning culture, an organization must allow access. So learners have to be able to access as and when they choose learning solutions. They need to have them at their fingertips. So we as IDs need to look at how accessible is the content that we are creating. Are we asking the organization how they're going to deploy the material we're creating? Are we including in our like learning design documents aspects of access and how people will um, go in and use their content? Structure is a key thing. And I know as instructional designers, we're always looking at the lesson I'm creating today. How does that fit into the bigger picture? How does it fit into the uh, learning strategy for the organization? How does it fit into the curriculum? Is there a curriculum at play or is it just a standalone piece? So the structure is really important. A positive learning culture needs that structure so that everything is relevant and relatable. And then you've got people and processes. So in order to make a positive learning culture is about everybody from leadership down being part of the solution. And it's about embedding learning within all processes. So again, when we're thinking about designing content, we need to think about how do learners access it? Has it got the structure and framework required to ensure that it is relatable and relevant? And how do people, leaders in the organization, um, staff in the organization, how, how do they become the ambassadors to push the content forward? And then processes, how do we embed what we're doing within the processes in a business? Those are key aspects to think about as an instructional designer. So I'm just gonna have a look here. What other things we can do with an organization? And if you are looking at this as a potential opportunity to support a business and almost create a good relationship with the organization you're working with. For example, I worked with an accountancy firm to create some compliance training for them about two or three years ago. And one of the things I did was to do a learning culture survey. So I literally went in and annoyed them for like two weeks and spoke to everybody I could and tried to establish, and I'm like, oh, scary picture there. This is a, um, a learning culture survey that was put together in 2004. So this was a long time ago. This is in a book and I'll get you the reference for that and put it into the chat later or share that with you. But this is a survey that you're meant to go through each one. So you go into an organization um, and you look through the pro learning culture side. I think one's negative and five's really positive. So you're meant to add up a score against each of the points. And then at the bottom, it tells you when you add them up, the highest score on whichever side gives you the learning culture. Is it a pro learning culture? Is it a positive learning culture? Or is it a negative learning culture within the business? I'm happy to share this out either afterwards, or you can reach out to me. Um, if you look me up on my sub 10 website, and send me a message. I'll get any of these materials over to you that you, you want or require. They are available online if you search also for learning culture survey. This one's a really good one though, because when you start to drill down, you can look at the pro learning culture side and it's all things about learning's part and parcel of everything they do. They learn from mistakes, they learn from projects. They have opportunities to learn continuously as an organization. People are encouraged to ask questions, share stories about successes and failures. That's part of the bigger learning culture. And then the anti-learning culture is the opposite of that. So it's very doom and gloom. People don't share what they're doing. There's assumptions about processes and procedures. They don't give attention to learning lessons from projects, et cetera. And learning's not highly valued. And I find a lot of organizations I'm in at the moment have 
a negative learning culture. It feels like learning's almost on the periphery out in the cold. And I want to bring that back in to the heart of the business. I think it's good for IDs as well, because we'll be valued more highly if they see the value of um, the learning culture being very positive. I, we actually created a quick, it's like one of those magazine tests that um, you can run through. And again, this is something I can share if you write to me at, at my, um, actually it's Angela at sub-10.co.uk. I can send any of these out to you, but these are quite simple. I've got a score on the side here. So basically the zero is a negative culture, the ones are neutral and the twos are positive. So I came up with some questions. So which of the following is true at your company? Learning is worth doing if, if you have the time. Learning gets in the way. Learning is an integral part of all that we do. And you can see there, you go through, we've done it as a little um, articulate little quiz. You go through and you pick the responses. Uh, then we've got things like people access learning at your company once a year, whenever they want to, when the manager tells them to. So I've got a number of questions here. I'm not going to go through all of them with you. But when you've gone through the questions, you get to the end and you get the response. So it gives you the idea of whether you've got a positive, a neutral or a negative learning culture and what the difference is between them. So as an instructional designer, there is something you could do around exploring a survey and then making maybe a report or a recommendation, even as part of your learning solution, it might be part of your learning design document, where you put in there ideas about um, what their learning culture is like, what you found from perhaps surveys that you've done, some highlights, some quotes, and then the value that you can add back is what you can do within your piece of learning, even within a 30 minute course that you're creating to help support, create that positive learning culture. And what I've done is um, I've looked at with that accountancy firm, for example, who I worked with, I looked at access. I looked at asking the stakeholders, you know, how are learners going to find your content? And um, when will they be required to do it? Is it just a one off? Can they redo it as many times as they want? Can they access it as and when they choose to? Can they use it as a reference piece of reference material? Um, and are there anything, you know, any shortcuts, for example, are there things that you're putting in place like pre-tests or a cheat sheet so that you allow people to access the same content, but in a slightly different format to suit their needs? And this all kind of ties in with diversity and inclusion and making sure that you're really um, coming up with solutions that, you know, really help support the learner. And then it's what do you recommend to the stakeholder? Because I know we're quite often when I'm in a meeting, it's quite difficult because you get somebody who really thinks they know what they want from a learning point of view. But I think as IDs, we really need to push forward with our thinking and highlight to them that we've perhaps discovered or uncovered a, a negative learning culture. And as I'm going through these, it's just to have a think about organizations you're working with at the moment. Does this offer a value add for them? Could it be something that you include as part of maybe a, a learning design document? And I did, I put in <laughs> to that company, I was working with the accountancy firm, I put in an idea of how the learning would be deployed. Actually, they didn't take it up. They put it all out all in one go in February. And then they, um, for the next uh, time they released it, they actually did do it in this style. So I had structured it with pieces of learning or content. So I had four or five different units and I recommended that they had a, communication campaign going on at the same time and they broke the content up into these pieces and released them over a number of weeks so that they could then assess and measure and put offline activities in between um, the units. So there's all sorts of things you can do in terms of access about recommendations. Structure as well. So things you need to be asking perhaps are around you know where and how does the content you're working on fit into the business learning strategy maybe that'll help them understand how important a learning strategy is how does it fit into the business goal or the intention for the content it's really important to understand the bigger picture and what will change if your content or learning is successful so again bigger picture stuff how does it all fit in and use bloom's taxonomy if they don't have any structure or any framework because that really is useful if you google that if you're not sure what bloom's taxonomy is 
it provides a framework or structure. It gives you levels um, that you can adhere to, and it gives you learning outcomes with action verbs that relate to each level. I use that a lot when I'm just creating a basic kind of knowledge or awareness um, selection of units. I'll ensure that the learning outcomes all match that knowledge level Bloom's taxonomy. So have a look at that. If you don't have any structure at all, that gives you a useful place to start. And of course, when we have um, an idea about the business goals, what people need to learn, what they need to do and what training is required, and we include that in our learning documentation as part of this learning culture that we're trying to create, something bigger than just a 30 minute course. When we understand what that 30 minute course is doing within the curriculum and the, the whole organization structure um, from a learning point of view, we can then measure it appropriately and see if they completed it, if they're doing that. It won't be that you as an ID are necessarily doing that evaluation and measuring it, but I would give the organization recommendations to say, you know, at six months after the training, do a survey, um, have the manager talk to the employee, see if they're doing what they should be doing in line with the learning that they've achieved and offer that up as part of the solution. Again, I won't go through this in a lot of detail, but this is what I would do in the learning design document is just document that, explain what the structure looks like, break it down, show how it should be um, put out there, include program goals or business goals, learning objectives. I even put in things like desired thinking and behavioral outcomes. So what are the success points you're looking for? Because these are the ones that will directly impact that learning culture and make sure it's very positive and has purpose. People and processes. So when you're talking with an organization, really find out what processes do they have in place within the company and how does my piece of learning fit into that process? Is there a process that exists where the learning that I'm doing could seamlessly fit in and be a reference point? So is it something you're creating about a piece of equipment or a piece of machinery or a process within customer services? Could it be embedded within the processes they already have? Because um, that's going to make it seamlessly fit into the, the workflow rather than be something that separates itself and sit, sits aside on the sidelines. I'd also look at who could be an ambassador around the organization and how could they be weaved into your solution as well? How can they carry the message forward that you're trying to achieve within the learning? And so just to kind of, because I'm, I'm only doing a half hour session, I know it's a lot of information coming at you here, but just to sort of summarize the idea here, we're really living in a world where there's constant change. And as instructional designers, I mean, certainly over the, the last 20 years, I've not seen that many changes in, in, in terms of learning and the way learning works within organizations, apart from they're really... Um, is a bigger move towards online learning. Of course, that's gone from, as I said before, 5% in 1995 to about over 90% of organizations are using online learning at the moment. And that obviously the pandemic pushed towards that, but we've got so many changes and in, in the environment around us coming into play with, I think they're actually saying now that when you leave university, the skills that you leave with or if you leave a college or school and you've got vocational qualifications, um, the skills that you have will only last about five years within an organization that you work in. They that At that point, they're redundant because you'll need to upskill or reskill because things are changing so quickly in terms of automation um, and AI and processes are changing. As I say, a lot of the practical tasks that we're doing today will be replaced probably by machinery um, or automated processes. So we've got to think as instructional designers, rather than just being reactive to everything we're seeing and reacting, even I've sat in meetings with organizations where I just do what they want me to do. We need to take more control, I think. We need to understand more about what the future of learning looks like, what future workplaces look like, how they'll be utilizing learning, how, I mean, we can't obviously control education tech, um, like LMS systems very 
readily or easily, but we can certainly move things in the right direction by making recommendations to organizations. We can look at appraising their learning culture as maybe an add-on or a value add to the services that you do, particularly if you're a freelancer. Look at that as an opportunity, perhaps even a prelude to any activity that you carry out with the business is to say to them, look, we offer or I offer a learning culture assessment. And off the back of that, I can do surveys, I can highlight areas for improvement, and then we can work out where the content I'm creating fits into that whole structure. And then think about access. Think about how learners access your course, how they can have it at their fingertips. Is it a reference tool? Are there cheat sheets? Are there things you can do to make it more accessible? Does it have structure? Have you got a framework in place? How does it fit into a bigger curriculum? How do you pull processes and people that already exist within the organization into the solution to really propel that content forward? And include that information in any documentation you provide back to an organization like the, the learning design document or a report that you do against the findings of your learning culture survey. And then I, I definitely look at generating that opportunity for yourself as an instructional designer. And let's kind of be in a more commanding position rather than just reacting to what's going on around us. Let's be driving forward the change that's required to ensure that we are helping support organizations with their learning culture. And we're doing, in doing that, I think you forge a relationship with, with organizations that's longer term. So you're not just coming in and doing a one-off piece of learning for them. You're actually helping support them in an ongoing way because they'll come back to you if they think you know your stuff and you're very good at uh, highlighting a problem and coming up with a solution they'll come back to you so I think you generate a deeper relationship with your customers or clients as you're working with them I'm going to stop there I think there's only about three minutes left um, before I need to wrap up but I can share these slides I'll talk to Tom afterwards and see how I could get these out to people or you can contact me at sub 10 and I say just look google up um, sub 10 uh, it's sub 10 because everything we create is really short and sharp um but yeah if you want to get any of the materials that i've um, shared on this presentation today that's brilliant i can share those out if there's any questions i think there's like two minutes left i can maybe address one or two otherwise you can reach out to me as well with questions that's brilliant. Thank you so much. That is really interesting. Um, one question that did come up early on was um, mm. uh, people were interested in the idea of learning combined with the Internet of Things. Ah, um, perfect. I, I just, I guess it's maybe not the ideal topic for like, a, we've got two minutes, but uh, <laughs> very high level. So how, how do you see that kind of um, yeah. coming into the world? Yeah, there's the, everything connects, which is fascinating. And I think this this is where we kind of almost need to take our blinkers off as, as IDs and look at the bigger picture. I'm actually going into an organization this afternoon and they've got a warehouse with lots of equipment. They actually have a forklift truck um, which monitors how often it has a load on it. So they can actually assess how often it's used, whether it's used effectively. They've got other equipment that is monitoring data about use. And I think from that data, normally you get a manager would go over and have a look and say, oh, that's not being used effectively. Is it a problem with the person who's using the equipment? Is it a problem with the equipment? What I'd love to see with the internet of things is data like that. So say you're using a piece of machinery, it's flagging up that it's not being used effectively for some reason. I'd love to see that as a trigger. That data goes into some sort of system, some sort of digital system within the organization, flags up a warning, that then triggers in your learning platform that the person operating that piece of equipment was Tom at nine o'clock on a Monday, wasn't very effective, we've assessed the data. Tom, we recommend you do this unit on how to use this equipment efficiently. So we get this connection where the internet of things is using data to trigger learning events. And then we can monitor the impact. We can watch you, Tom, working on that equipment next week and see if there's an improvement. If there isn't, we can assess that further. Is it further training you required? Maybe a manager can step in at, at second defense point there and 
talk to you and work with you. But the Internet of Things is absolutely fascinating. I think there's a lot more we can do with data and triggering learning events so that we're pushing learning in front of people at the right point in time. And I think that's where AI is going to come into play in the future. But I think we need to drive it forward with ideas and coming up with short bits of content, et cetera, that will help play into that. So I know that's kind of a short version of the answer, but I hope that helps. And I could talk all day about Internet of Things, to be honest. <laughs> uh, it's, it's, it's a super exciting uh, potential future reality, but um, yeah. we are right up on time. So thank you ever so much, because I know you've got to uh, go and dash and uh, go and work with said businesses to uh, make, <laughs> make this reality happen. Um, so that's thank great. you so much for making the time to uh, come and talk with us this morning. And thank Don't you worry. to everyone who joined us as well. First thing, um, our next session is at, and as always, I have shifted my schedule and have lost that page. Um, our next session is at 11.15 GMT. Um, it's with Phil Lord David, and we're looking at how a product mindset can help in L&D. Uh, so another great topic. Until then, we'll see you later. Thank you. Bye.